Disneyland is officially old, and that's a great thing. And even though Walt never wanted Disneyland to be a museum, it kind of is in some regards, and I also think that's a great thing. But in 1953 to 1954, when they were constructing Disneyland, they did cut some production corners by finding things that already existed. Today, we're gonna look at 13 items that predate Disneyland, and we're gonna do them from youngest item to oldest item. But oh, there are so many more. I wanna share with you some of the urban legends that exist around these pieces. I can't confirm that all of them are real. Some of them have conflicting stories and I'll share both of those with you. Like my grandmother always taught me, never ever let the truth get in the way of a good story. Many of these have been taken down to basically like a Disneyland legend. And I love sharing these stories. And in my heart, they're all true. But to, well, actually guy in the comment section, they're all false. Viewer discretion is advised. I suggest having a heartfelt imagination to enjoy some of these backstories. Number 13 on our list is also our first controversy on our list, is the brick pattern wall or the brick transition wall. There's two stories about this one, but it's on the list because obviously this was built at Disneyland, but it was built early because maybe it was a guide on how other buildings would be built where each quadrant of this wall is a different brick pattern. It would be erected over on Main Street. Workers could come up and see which pattern they were going to install in the building that they were set dressing. However, a second camp of Disney fans believed this was going to be a transitional wall where on this side, the Main Street side, it has a modern day brick texture. And then on this side, it has a old school brick texture that would take us into Liberty Street, the never built land that would exist behind these backstage doors. You can see that these bricks are smooth, but then a texture, a grain is applied on the top left hand corner and then it's smooth again on the bottom. These bricks on the bottom right have a slight amount of distress, but these bricks on the upper right have a lot more distress. Some folks want to think that it's a test pattern. Others think that it's a lost transitional wall to a land that was never made. I'd love to know what you think. Number 12 on our list is the Disneyland Opera House, which was the first building built at Disneyland and it was the lumber mill where all of the different facades that you see on Main Street were constructed in this building, put on a flatbed, driven down Main Street, and then pinned up at their proper location. And the Opera House is a opening day attraction, but fans couldn't go inside of it. It sat here on display for about six years. In 1961, it would open for its first display where people could come in and see props from Babes in Toyland. Approximately three and a half million feet of lumber circulated through this mill. And of course, Mr. Lincoln wouldn't show up until after the World's Fair in 1964. Number 11 on our list, Walt's Bench guesstimated to be built somewhere around 1937. This wasn't always inside the Opera House. This prop would show up around 2009. Disney legend has it that it belongs to Disney legend Tony Baxter and it's on loan to Disneyland from TB. Way to go, TB. And honestly, it's hard to imagine Disneyland without this sitting here. Truly remarkable piece of Disney history, if the story's true. Number 10 on our list, the Los Angeles Light Post. The production of the Light Post is assumed to be around 1928, and it was a light post in Los Angeles until it was knocked over. Famed Disneyland interior designer Emil Curry is said to have purchased it when it was knocked over. Disney legend has it that Emil was driving home, the lamp post was knocked over on Wilshire Boulevard, and he bought it for $5 as scrap metal. The light post gets brought to Disneyland and converted over to a flagpole. It is a 1955 opening day attraction, and every single day, even during the pandemic, there is a flag ceremony to bring down the American flag at the end of every day at Disneyland, and then raise it back up the next. 
number eight and number nine come to us from 1922, and they also come to us from the great country of Canada. King Arthur's Carousel and Casey Jr.'s Train produced in 1922 in Philadelphia and then moved to a theme park in Toronto, Canada, a location known as Sunnyside Beach Park was the original home to the King Arthur Carousel. Walt Disney would purchase it and move it to Disneyland. Walt Disney wanted every child to be able to have the same experience. Therefore, he wanted his carousel to only have jumping horses on it. So the sleds that were originally on here were removed and taken over to Casey Jr. where they became carts for folks who wanted to go up and down the track. Oh yeah, Casey Jr. is back. I absolutely love that this is the oldest and kind of most classic ride inside of Walt's Disneyland. Next up on our list is inside of the Penny Arcade. Number six and seven on our list are the orchestration machines. This one on Main Street was built around 1907 and the one in the back of the Bonanza in Frontierland was believed to be built around 1915. Both still play music and give a bizarre look back to early 1900s entertainment. Disneyland's Welt Style 4 concert orchestration, manufactured in Germany in 1907, built to simulate an orchestra. This instrument has 265 pipes, bass drum, snare drum, timpani, cymbal, and triangle. Purchased by Walt Disney in 1953, it has had a home here in the Penny Arcade since 1955. Now that's entertainment. On our list coming in from 1896 is the Dominguez Palm that sits at the edge of the Jungle Cruise and in Indiana Jones. A Canary Island date palm, and this was owned by the family that owned the property. Ron Dominguez asked Walt, I'll sell you my farm, but can you promise me that you'll keep my family tree? And Walt honored that promise. The tree was moved once to get put in its proper spot, and when they did, it weighed 50 tons. A tree from 1896 isn't the oldest living thing. That's number four next on our list. Number four, the oldest living thing at <laughs> Disneyland exists right inside of here. The Bolander Pine on the Storybook Canal Boats is believed to be about 150 years old, estimated to be from around 1870. It was a prop installed on the opening of Storybook Canal Boats, June 16th, 1956. As when it opened in 55, there were no props and it quickly would close after. It was found by a landscaping staff at nearby Van Damme State Park in California. It stands about two feet tall and it's one of the oldest dwarf pine trees found. And I think that it's poetic justice that the oldest living thing that could potentially live for the rest of Disneyland exists inside of Fantasyland where truly this tree can be the young at heart for as long as it wants to be. This one shocked me. Number three on our list, the French cannons. An opening day prop that is estimated to be from 1813, making it number three on our list. I had no idea they were that old. Used as artillery pieces by the French army during the Napoleonic Wars. From 1803 to 1815, man, that's old. The wars were a series of conflicts fought between the first French empire under Napoleon and an array of European coalitions. That is nuts. There were cannons in the town square of Walt's hometown of Marceline, Missouri. I think that's where the influence came from. These cannons were fired, but never in war. And here is another one that shocked me. Number two on our list, the Baltimore gas lamps. The gas lamps were an opening prop in 1955. They were able to buy them on the cheap as they were being sold as scrap metal. Not all of them are from the city of Baltimore. Others are also from St. Louis and from the city of Philadelphia. These were made around the early 1800s, and I can't say that it's these exact ones because Disney since has taken the gas lamps and they've created molds of them. And when you go to Walt Disney World and you see the lamps, those were created from molds made of the original lamps in Disneyland. Yeah, the story just goes on and on and on when we pull on the thread. Now, Disney used to have a cast member that would go by and light these every night, but they no longer do that. And the gas lamps are left on 24 seven, which from what I hear is incredibly safe 
and the best way to do it. You can see on the base of this one, it says St. Louis, and that St. Louis is pretty worn out where it's probably a replication of a replication. But we're at noon and it is still lit from who knows how many days before. Another find from interior designer Emil Curry, who just had an impeccable eye for all the pieces Walt would need to tell the Disneyland story and make it feel real. I am shocked at how old these are. I love doing videos like this because it's such a learning experience. Another thing that's old on our list is you not subscribing. That's starting to get old. What more do I have to do, Ed? Come on, bud. Thank you so much for subscribing to Hey Bricky. Eh, it's getting old, those of you that are watching and not subscribing. Now back to our list. Thank you for showing up. And the oldest thing at Disneyland by a country mile, the petrified tree. Estimated 50 to 70 million years old. That's insane. If this tree could talk, could it tell us what the real primeval world was like? Who knows? There's a couple of mixed stories on its legend. And one of those is that Walt bought it for Lillian as an anniversary gift. His daughter later said that that was just a joke and it really wasn't an anniversary gift. But let's ponder for a moment if it was. Because what would say that I love you forever better than something that has already lasted the tale of time? 70 million years is a long time to say, I'll love you forever. Going along with the anniversary joke, Lillian said, well, it was too big for the mantle, so she decided to donate it to Disneyland. Purchased for $1,650 in 1950s money, and this portion is from the tree that stood 200 feet tall. This portion of the tree weighs five tons and was from what we now call today, Colorado. And I'm gonna create my own Disney legend and say that it actually fell from the sky and was once a spire from Batu. I mean, it does definitely look like this maybe inspired the look for Batu. I love that this prop sits here and all the different props inside of Disneyland, how they're placed to tell different stories and to take lands into different moments of time. If you want to know more about Disneyland set design, make sure you watch this video right here celebrating Emil Curry, who we've mentioned a couple of times in this video. The man had an eye for detail and brought those details to Disneyland. Ricky here from the edge of 70 million years ago. Thank you so much for watching.